All right, guys, Christopher Barnett here. Welcome back to my channel. Um, so today, I'm just going to give you kind of an update as to what's going on um, in terms of UCSB and coronavirus right now. Uh, and then after, we'll get into the actual 10 things that you should know about before you start lifting. Um, so basically what's going on here is there hasn't really been any confirmed cases of coronavirus in uh, Santa Barbara County or in Goleta, to my knowledge, or in UCSB. Uh, but Chancellor Yang, uh, the chancellor at our, at our school, uh, based on kind of what's going on around uh, the country with all the other campuses, kind of closing down, doing remote uh, schooling and uh, remote exams. He's kind of following in their footsteps. Uh, and so in response to all this commotion about the coronavirus, uh, UCSB has made the decision to kind of transition to a remote uh, instruction. I know a lot of us, uh, at least for me, I had two of my finals, or one of my final was canceled uh, altogether. Uh, another one is gonna be completely a take home final. And then the, the third one is gonna be in person, but it's gonna be a shorter exam. So yeah, that's that. Uh, it's going to be a similar scenario for a lot of other UCSB students here. Uh, and so yeah, we're just kind of playing it by year. We got to be flexible with what's going on. Uh, and I might not be able to make a lot of UCSB videos, at, like in terms of being on campus, uh, simply because I'm going to be back home um, throughout all of this. So uh, yeah, obviously I'm still going to be, you know, being instructed, but it's going to be online for the time being. Uh, and so yeah, guys. Um, that's that, and now I'm going to kind of transition over to the 10 things that you should know before you start lifting. Now, first and foremost, I'm going to address the fact that yes, I did make this video before. Uh, it's just that the audio was not in sync. Number one, the quality was just very, you know, very poor, and uh, I, I didn't like how I conducted that video. So I'm redoing it. Hopefully, you guys will benefit from this, uh, and hopefully, I can articulate my thoughts a little bit better. So. The first thing that you should know before uh, getting into lifting, before you start training, is that you need not to train for others, but to train for yourself. Don't go into the gym thinking that, you know, by working out and getting ripped big and whatnot, that you're automatically gonna get girls or you're gonna get more attention, you're gonna get more friends, you're gonna be more popular. Uh, it doesn't really work like that. You don't wanna train for other people to impress them because you ultimately rely on that. And when you, and when, uh, you ultimately, like if you don't impress them, you lose that motivation to train uh, because you really want to just find something to train for and train for yourself. Train because you enjoy it or you're trying to, you're trying to be better than you were yesterday. Don't train because so-and-so told you to do. Don't train because you, know, you want to impress a girl or a guy or whatever. Um, do it for yourself and honestly that's going to benefit you and sustain you much more in fitness for the long run. The second thing on my list of 10 things you should know before you start lifting is you have to set reasonable expectations as well as goals. Um, now when I first got into it I uh, made the mistake of setting very unreasonable goals and expectations. I wanted to be 200 pounds at 5'7 and honestly like nat naturally first off obviously I'm a natural and I'm kind of like a mix between uh, ectomorph and mesomorph ecto being the skinny type mesomorph being the more in the in between the skinnier and heavy body types regarded as the more athletic build I don't really have uh, the genetic potential to be super super heavy so being five foot seven reaching that 200 pound goal is really really hard and it's going to be really hard for me if I were to even reach that naturally if I even could so obviously for me that would not be a reason expectation for right now um, especially because I haven't even reached 190 yet I'm still at like 180 so before I even reach 200 if I even could I would probably be better off setting goal of 185 190 pounds um, in addition to that, I made another mistake of going into it when I first started that I was just going to be, you know, this massively like super insane looking person as a natural. You think that just by lifting weights, you're just going to get, you know, super freaking massive and that's not really how it works. There's a lot of things that go into it, uh, including genetics, nutrition, you know, sleep, uh, uh, the amount of intensity that you train with and frequency and so forth. So, you know, you have to set reasonable expe expectations and goals. Don't go setting like these massive, um, really unattainable goals that that are ultimately going to discourage you from continuing to do it. Because if you do set like small incremental goals over time that lead to a kind of overarching vision, then it's going to be a lot more sustainable. Number one, you're going to find motivation after each time you uh, achieve those goals. And overall, you're just going to enjoy the process way more than uh, if you were to just like set this one massive, you know, unattain completely unattainable goal and then you ultimately never reach it. And then, you know, you end up quitting because of it, which obviously 
that's not what we want here. So the third thing uh, on my list is uh, you're going to have to focus on progressive overload, especially if you, especially if you want to build muscle. Uh, basically all progressive overload is, is it's just kind of increasing the, the volume and intensity with which you train over time. So for example, if I start off with just by, you know, benching, you know, just 135 for, you know, four sets of 10, 10. maybe over time I want to increase that to maybe four sets of 12, or maybe or over time I want to increase that weight to be maybe 145 and do that four sets of 10 again. So uh, that's just an example, a very simplistic example of progressive overload. Uh, it's all it is, it's just over time increasing the intensity and or volume with which you train. It's basically just make it harder, make it challenging. Do it a little bit harder the time you did before. You know, train each uh, with you know with effort, with focus, um, and obviously not every training session is going to be perfect. But you want to over time gradually make these small improvements, gradually make things difficult over time. That's the principle of progressive overload. And I promise you, I promise you, assuming you know proper nutrition, sleep, and uh, you know everything else, you know you will go so far with progressive overload. The fourth thing I want to emphasize a lot is you have to, have to, have to uh, emphasize technique with your lifts, um, as well as proper form. Um, this is not only going to help you with injury prevention, but it's also going to help you um, get stronger and as well as push more weight. Um, previously with my squat, um, I used to have very poor technique, and as a result of that poor technique, I had a little bit of tendonitis, uh, some back issues. Um, and even recently, I had a little bit of a core injury, which not, was not necessarily to poor technique. It was more because I um, kind of overdid it with squats a little bit. And that was a little bit of my fault, uh, simply because I kept trying to go for maxes previously. Uh, I don't do that anymore, of course. You know, I'm more smart about it. Uh, but yeah, injury prevention is also another important thing that kind of uh, is kind of a, a little subcategory of technique. Um, so with proper technique, uh, again, the major things that you want to learn for for technique is proper bench press form, uh, proper squat form, uh, proper you know barbell row form, uh, deadlift form. Uh, especially with your really, really, really heavy, heavier compound movements, um, technique. I cannot emphasize how important that is. Um, again, with injury prevention, that's going to help that. And then, uh, like I said, it's going to help you with uh, pushing more weight, uh, better progressive overload, and you're going to get more uh, muscular and or strength benefits uh, from that proper form and technique. And one more thing I wanted to add, and this is not necessarily a category on its own, it's just kind of weaved into this category right here. Uh, I want you to uh, really focus on core training. Now, in the very beginning, I kind of neglected core training, uh, especially last year. This was one of my big mistakes. I really, really, really neglected core training while I was progressively overloading with my squat. And as you guys may know, I kind of got that little small core injury in my groin. And uh, I, I'm a strong believer that because I neglected that core training, um, I was ultimately afflicted by you know this little injury of mine. So uh, again, core training, I can't emphasize how important that is. Uh, it's like having a strong base. If you don't have a strong base, everything else is gonna collapse. So core training, very important, uh, as well as technique, as well as injury prevention. So number five on my list is gonna be a little, like two things here. It's going to be hydration, as well as nutrition. So uh, hydration, very, very, very important. Um, when I was on prep, uh, my coach had me drink a, a gallon of water a day, sometimes a gallon and a half. Uh, it was absolutely insane. I was going to the bathroom frequently, uh, but honestly, because I drank all that water, not only did it help me with my digestion, um, you know, controlling my appetite, but I also st it helps me stay a little bit more focused, a little more alert, and uh, help replace all that lost fluid from you know all the sweating that I was doing. Um, and your body is made of like 60 or 70 percent of water, so naturally uh, you're gonna want to have to like intake water, you know, as you expel that water through working out and sweating, uh, just for general health benefits uh, as well as performance benefits overall. And in addition for nutrition, again, this is gonna be extremely, extremely, extremely important. Uh, if you don't have proper nutrition, you, honestly. <laughs> If you made any gains, I'd be surprised. This was one of the mistakes I made very at the very beginning. I didn't track what I was eating. I was just kind of eating whatever and working out. 
and I, I'm a firm believer that because I wasn't consistently, um, you know, eating that proper, you know, nutrition, you know, a proper kind of blend of protein, carbs, and you know, fats, uh, I believe that I did halt my progress for the first couple of years. Um, it wasn't until like about my third and fourth year of training that I did take nutrition a lot more seriously. I was a lot more consistent with it, and because of that, that's why I felt that I made a lot more gains in the last two years than my first uh, two years. Uh, because normally people do make kind of newbie gains, uh, but I think I kind of skipped that area because I didn't have that proper nutrition. Uh, and because of that, the last two years was where I saw most of my growth. Um, again, nutrition, fundamental, way more important probably than training, to be honest. Uh, and that's that, and we're going to move on to the next one. Uh, number six, this is a huge mistake I made um, early on, but uh, you guys really, when you're first starting, is you should find like-minded individuals uh, and or people who are going to help you or push you. When I was first getting started, I made the mistake of honestly doing all of this on my own. I worked out a little bit with my dad, but he wasn't really into the whole bodybuilding, you know, gym rat kind of lifestyle. But um, uh, and I didn't really have in that that other person or anyone to kind of push me or work out with. So for the first, honestly, like one, two, and like maybe three years, I basically worked out and trained by myself. And it was honestly a huge learning process, learning curve. And that can be good in its own right, because you kind of learn how your body works and you learn what you like and what works for you. Uh, but at the same time, you lose out of the benefit of getting that extra motivation from, say, a workout partner, getting that extra spot from a workout partner, uh, and you know, just having someone be there to push you, keep you accountable, uh, and keep you consistent. In this past last year, I've been training a lot more with uh, friends and training partners, and it's been a really, really, really beneficial. I've been getting better workouts in, um, and I've just really been enjoying it because bodybuilding, a lot of people think, you know, Sure, in a certain sense, it can be a very selfish sport about you know just one person. But if you kind of share that journey and that process with other people by like having training partners, connecting with people in the fitness community around you and stuff like that, it's not just about yourself. And you'll come to realize that if you do get into lifting seriously and or bodybuilding. So definitely, I recommend finding a training partner if you can. If not, just simply surround yourself with someone um, that's either more knowledgeable than you that can help you or just a general person that can push you or motivate you and keep you accountable. Number seven, uh, I definitely recommend training for balance. Uh, and this can mean a couple of things. This actually um, does have two meanings in my opinion and the way I'm thinking of it. So first and foremost, a very simple way is train for uh, balance, balance training that is. So this is like things like stabilization, um, uh, you know, training yourself under proprioceptively enriched environments, meaning controlled instability. Uh, that means like doing things like going on a, f uh, like a, like a BOSU ball and like just putting your knee on there, standing upright on your knee, on one knee to, to balance and do that with both legs to kind of increase that hip stability. That's just one example of balance training, uh, single leg RDLs, and a bunch of other things that I personally just kind of drawing a blank right now, but there's a bunch of other exercises and techniques uh, you can do to increase your balance. And the reason you do want to increase your balance uh, in terms of like, you know, things like balancing on one leg and stuff like that is because it's honestly going to help you um, with all your compound movements. Because if let's suppose that you have in tr tremendous instability with like your ankles or your just your overall trunk and you're doing squats over time as you you know and progress with your squats maybe in the beginning you won't hurt yourself because you're starting off with lighter weight but as you get heavier and heavier and heavier if you are unstable you're gonna a develop uh huge muscular imbalances or b you're gonna hurt yourself it's just a matter of time if you don't have that proper stability don't have that proper balance throughout your body then you're just gonna hurt yourself and you're gonna get injured and i'm a firm believer that because i was very bad with my instability or with my stability and balance training um, i ended up developing muscular imbalance in my legs uh, my left leg is like for me it's noticeably bigger than my right leg um, and in addition to that, I also have a little bit of a tilt in my squat. When I squat up, I tilt this way. Uh, and I think that's attributed to the fact that I didn't do a lot of balance and stability training uh, earlier on. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Now that I am implementing more of that balance and stability training, I do feel a lot better with all my, uh, my, my um, lifts. Uh, and in addition, uh, I did mention a second meaning for balance training. Um, you wanna train for balance throughout your physique. If you are training for you know, physique purposes, then train your body evenly throughout. You know, when you're just starting out, you're not going to have a weak point. 
Weak point is a bodybuilding term. If you're a, been bodybuilding for years or whatever, and you know you, you neglect training with your legs, and your upper body's huge and your legs are tiny, you know your legs would be your weak point. It's a bodybuilding term. But if you're first starting out, regardless of whether you're doing bodybuilding, powerlifting, um, you really want to just train everything evenly. Train everything so that they grow all together and they they grow uh, in a balanced fashion together. That way, down the line, you're not going to have to worry about these weird, you know, muscular imbalances where your upper body is way too big, big for your lower body. Your lower body is way too big for your upper body. Obviously, it's all going to be a little subjective, but you want to train everything with balance. Everything um, will just flow together much more nicely and overall just having that well-balanced physique is going to be better off for you you're going to feel better about yourself in my opinion and yeah that's that train for balance and those were the two meanings so we're going to move on to the next one the next one is going to be number eight uh which is sleep now i've mentioned this before and i'm going to mention it again right now sleep is absolutely critical um you honestly you do most of your growing in your sleep you know not only in terms of height but in terms of muscular gains or even uh fat loss Sleep is absolutely critical. If you don't have enough sleep, you're not going to make any gains. It's just as simple as that. You're going to lose focus. You're going to lose clarity of thought. And you're just going to have a kind of a crappy life if you don't have enough sleep. So uh, my personal recommendation is like, I would say, so under ideal circumstances, I would say eight hours plus would be optimal. Uh, but again, I, I do take into account that maybe a lot of my following, uh, they might be busier if they're college students, they might not be able to get those eight hours of sleep every day. I know I personally don't, you know, don't get eight hours of sleep every night, um, but try to get eight hours of sleep when you can. Focus on that. If you can get it, then get it. You know, if you have to go down to seven or six hours of sleep, not gonna be the worst thing in the world. Um, Eight is just a simple recommendation for optimal scenarios. Um, so the reason you want to have that optimal sleep, um, just off the top of my head, this is just a little factoid that I know, uh, is that there is a lot of testosterone production during your sleep. And so that kind of helps you repair and grow those muscles. In addition to that, sleep has a number of other benefits. Uh, as I mentioned, mental clarity, focus, uh, general well-being, uh, uplifted mood. Uh, in addition to the gains. So, so now for number nine, this is going to be uh, kind of two things in one, and this is going to be genetics and social media. So when you first get into it, I want you guys to go into it um, kind of with an understanding of what your genetics might be like. So look at the body type of maybe your parents, for example. This is gonna be your best kind of uh, reference, best kind of guide to see how, what you might look like either as an adult or um, what kind of like genetic potential you have in terms of muscle building. So uh, my parents, uh, my mom is kind of short and, and a little bit stockier and my dad is kind of taller and a little skinnier and I kind of got a little bit of a blend of those uh, where I got this kind of trunkier, kind of kind of like thicker midsection but like I got these skinnier limbs and uh, it was and I kind of have the height in between my taller dad and my shorter mom. And so that's kind of my kind of understanding of how I came to be like this. And so uh, by taking those two into consideration, I realized that uh, personally, uh, if I were to kind of judge myself, I don't have the best muscle building genetics simply because neither of my parents are very bulky. Neither of my parents, you know, have really good mus muscle insertions uh, and neither of my parents are like, you know, super, you know, buff or, you know, whatever. I mean, like looking at my dad's younger pictures, he certainly got ripped. My dad was easily able to get ripped. He was always a lean kid. And I think I kind of got a little bit of those uh, genetics inherited in me. And so that's kind of where I, you know, stand in terms of what I think my genetics are. And I challenge you guys to kind of look, look back at your parents' old photos of when they were young or what they look like right now. And that's gonna kind of give you a hint as to what kind of genetic potential you might have uh, in terms of muscle building and in terms of fitness as well. And I also mentioned social media. They're kind of related these two subjects and kind of not. I just kind of lump them together. But social media, I want you guys to be very, 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 very aware of both the pros and the cons. The cons definitely are gonna be the fact that a lot of people use Photoshop. Uh, People in their photos on Instagram, people in their videos on YouTube, that's not actually how they look like, generally speaking. You know, uh, people normally post the best, most optimal photos of themselves. They don't, they like to put on filters. They like to put on all these cool edits and stuff like that. And so, uh, and they have optimal lighting and maybe in a regular setting, uh, that's not really what those people look like. And you see like how many followers they have, millions of followers, hundreds of thousands of followers. But honestly, don't get too caught up in the amount of followers because when you see those people, usually the people with the most amount of followers um, are either because they generally, genuinely help, you know, uh, 
a lot of people and like that's what the people like but but social media also does cater to the genetically elite that's just how it is uh, it's not not really anything you can do about it i just want you guys to consider that all these top people like you might not look like them and i want you to be realistic with your goals you might not look like those guys because they are quote unquote the genetically elite a lot of them but that's not to say you can develop any kind of decent physique at all like that's not a reason to not even try uh, because you don't know sometimes you might discover that you do have good genetics or sometimes you might discover that you don't even need good genetics to build a decent physique like I don't have great genetics but I've been able to develop you know a moderately you know a decent physique over time I've been able to put on a lot of muscle over time I've been able to bring up uh, my legs a lot over the past year despite me my dad having tiny legs despite my mom having tiny legs you can't uh, be better than what your genetics will allow for but you can maximize your genetics and you can maximize what you are innately given if that makes sense so yeah guys just be careful social media there's a lot of good out there but there's also a lot of bad and I just want you guys be aware that not everything is truth not everything is good not everything is real and try to do your best to kind of separate all the junk uh, you know from the actual stuff that's gonna be helpful for you and that's gonna actually inspire you and the things that are actually realistic and number 10 uh, last thing on my list is I want you guys to go into fitness into weight training and all that with the understanding that everyone everyone is going to have their own training philosophy and all of it is gonna differ from person to person from individual to individual from coach to coach there are some people that might say you know let's you know we train heavy we train hard blood and guts warrior time let's go that's how some people think other people say okay let's go into the gym gym but we stimulate not annihilate okay and they focus on the reps you know the quality of the reps and so forth it's just they're just different training styles different training philosophies and obviously depending on what kind of like type of weight training you get into whether it's olympic weightlifting bodybuilding powerlifting uh crossfit or and so forth uh, it's all going to vary it's all going to differ um even within those own respective sports coaches philosophies are going to be different what's best for the individual is going to be different what's really important for you is that over time you want to kind of take in all these training philosophies and try them with yourself and you want to kind of make your own training philosophy over time what i say might be different from someone else you know what craig what coach you know greg duchette says is going to be different from you know the mountain dog or whatever they're, they're just different training philosophies nobody is 100 percent right uh, and just know that all this is a, is a, it's a learning curve, it's a learning process. Listen to those that are wiser than you, and then over time accumulate that knowledge and make your own training philosophy out of all of this. I ser sincerely hope that you guys did enjoy um, some of my tips, my advice as to what you guys should know and consider before getting into lifting. If you guys have any questions for me, please comment them down below. Uh, you can ask me, DM me on Instagram at CB317Fitness. And yeah, if you guys like this video, smash that like button. Uh, turn on post notifications and please make sure to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you guys in the next one.